the Q&A box to submit a question at any time and we'll get to those at the end and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And para interpretación en español, haga clic en el botón que dice interpretation. Es posible que primero debe hacer clic en more. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tabitha and we can get started. Good evening, everyone. We are truly excited to be able to have this meeting and for you to take a little bit of time to join us tonight. I'm going to keep my remarks as brief as possible, but first and foremost, just wanting to thank our amazing and extraordinary panelists who um, will be introduced shortly by Grace. Um, each time that they're asked to kind of talk a little bit about not only their roles within the city, city enterprise, um, but introduce themselves to you directly. But we are definitely appreciative of their time, so we want to make sure that we get that on the record. We appreciate all of the ways that they serve our community um, and help us to approach this conversation tonight with respect to are we prepared or, for uh, this summer in terms of a livability and safety. Um, on behalf of PPNA's entire staff and board and the community, we also want to give a, a special thank you to the members of the South Minneapolis Public Safety Coalition, who we are hosting this particular meeting in collaboration with. Um, my brief comments about the South Minneapolis Public Safety Coalition is that it is a group of uh, community members, whether it be representatives of organizations and businesses and individuals um, ha who have been meeting for the past four or five years in service of trying to advance the conversation about how do we improve uh, livability and, our, and safety in our community in a holistic way. Um, you can learn more on our website at www.ppna.org. And without further ado, um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna turn it back over to Grace to introduce our first speaker. And um, after each has gone, we will then move quickly into our Q&A session. Thank you again for being with us. Thanks everyone. We're gonna get started today with Commissioner Gretchen Musicant out of the Health Department. We'll also be hearing later from Andrea Larson out of the City Coordinator's Office, Brett Kelly from the Interim Director of Public Works and Chief Arredondo will be joining us. He's just running a little late this evening. So with that, I'll turn it over to Gretchen. I'm gonna share my screen here and we'll get. Thank you so much, Grace and Tabitha. I'm happy to, happy to be here. And uh, when I think about um, public safety and livability, there are so many things that the health department does uh, related to that. Um, certainly our response to COVID, um, our work uh, on the opioid addiction issues, even our work in environmental justice and safety. But uh, today, tonight, I'm gonna to focus on the work of the Office of Violence Prevention, which is one of the units within the health department. You can go to the next slide. So there are several programs that um, have uh, in many cases already been underway, are, are growing and expanding, uh, that I want you to get a sense of um, how they are all connected to the work of the city. And so I'm gonna describe each one as we go. And so the first one is Project Life, which is also uh, referred to as Group Violence Intervention or GBI. And that is an evidence-based approach uh, that relies on a, sort of a three-part partnership between the community members, social service providers, and law enforcement acting together to address the actions of gangs or groups that are most responsible for driving serious violence. And we have been doing that mostly in North Minneapolis since 2016 and have seen really some remarkable uh, impacts, a 71% reduction in shootings um, that were related to gang involvement. In 2021, uh, because of some increased investment in this program, we have moved uh, rigorously into South Minneapolis and we have two consultants uh, who are now working uh, full-time or working on uh, GBI in South Minneapolis. And um, <clears throat> we are also working on a, a variation of the group violence intervention that focuses more on young people, juveniles. Um, and so we're working with the probation, uh, county probation folks and trying to figure out how a model would work um, to make services available to young people uh, that are um, being served by probation. And that is uh, being piloted in South Minneapolis as well. Um, 
the next program is called Next Step. And that's the next slide. And Next Step is a partnership uh, between hospitals um, and the health department. And right now, Hennepin Healthcare, North Memorial, and most recently, Abbott Northwestern are all providing services to people who come into the hospital because they have been a victim of a gunshot, stabbing, or other violent assault injury. And we have found uh, through that program, uh, having served about uh, almost 500 people, that uh, it really has reduced recidivism in the hospitals. So people are not as, uh, you know, much less likely to come back to the hospital uh, injured violently. The program really looks at helping people not just heal their physical wounds, but also thinking about the supports that they need in order to return to a, a healthy life uh, in the community and cuts down on, on retaliatory violence um, as a result of, of being injured. And as I said, as a result of expanded funding, we have moved into Abbott Northwestern um, and are, have a program running there now. The next slide is about Minneapolis US, which is a strategic outreach initiative and is connected to um, national and actually worldwide uh, research that is um, that has shown to be effective. Uh, Cure Violence Global is the organization we are working with and they are giving us technical assistance on this program. And what this does is it uses informal mediation non-physical contact, um, non-physical conflict resolution, and interruption expertise using trusted community members and working on the street to stop conflicts before they happen and as they are happening. They will also be working to foster healing and mobilizing communities to reject violence through strategies like community gathering and peace walks. In 2021, we are really um, entering this program in, in a, a, a um, most formalized way. We gave it a, an early jump start in 2020, but 2021 and the funding we have is allowing us to really formally launch this program. And so there is a competitive RFP um, process that is being used. And uh, we will be making decisions, uh, funding decisions by the end of April, and then tapping into the expertise of the Cure Violence Global um, Organization to help us with training in May, and then do a community rollout of six teams, um, probably in June. You may experience that there are some folks uh, working under this model currently because we did get it started late in 2020. And so we have extended the contracts of those organizations so that they can continue to serve the community while we, while we start this more formal process. And they are working um, on Lake Street and around 38th in Chicago. Next slide. So something we've been doing for a number of years and it's been actually recognized as a national model is uh, what we call the Blueprint Approved Institute. And what we are doing through that is we work with com the community to build the capacity and broaden the network of violence prevention partners. People who are naturally working on this issue at the community level, we're helping bring additional skills and resources and connections for them uh, to do their work and maybe expand their ability to do their work. And so in 2021, um, we have increased funding for this program as well. And it's going to allow us to have a specific cohort in South Minneapolis. In the past, our funding was sufficient for us to look at, at uh, proposals from across the city um, and not uh, to be able to really designate um, enough co of a cohort in any one part of the city. So, this year, we have um, eight South Minneapolis organizations uh, which are currently participating and they will be uh, participating in the training and so on, but they will also be bringing programming to the community and we believe that will begin in June. The next uh, area is a uh, violence prevention fund. And this is a fund that um, is 
available more generally um, to support uh, all kinds of activities that come forward from the community. Examples include um, community, community building, arts activation, youth skill training, street outreach, trauma awareness, resilience training, those sorts of things. And we have additional funding in 2021 budget to allow for funding more agencies. Um, a competitive request for a proposal process is being used to determine who the eligible agencies are there. And we expect that um, we will be making funding decisions by the end of April. So far, about a third of the applicants received are from South Minneapolis um, and plan to do their specific programming there. And we expect that the projects will begin in June. And then finally, I don't have a slide about it, but um, <clears throat> because of the, the um, tension around uh, the trial of Derek Chauvin, uh, we have also been giving uh, given funds to have some trial related outreach teams and we have designated there are seven organizations two of them working in south minneapolis um, uh, two working in north minneapolis and then two organizations working citywide so they are out and about working with communities to understand tensions and trauma related to the trial and uh, helping to ameliorate uh, those so I'll stop there and I sure look forward to the questions and also look forward to hearing to uh, what my panel, my fellow panel members have to offer. Thanks, Commissioner Musicant. I'm gonna pull up uh, Andrea Larson's slides and we'll get going with you next, one second. Great, thank you. Um, while you're pulling that up, I can just introduce myself. I'm Andrea Larson. I'm a, uh, the Director of Strategic Management in the city's coordinator's office. And so I oversee a number of programs that provide um, strategic management type of support to the city, including the Office of Performance and Innovation, which has been responsible for um, leading the alternatives to police response work over the last couple of years now. You can go to the next slide. So um, before I get into some of the specific um, pilots that are launching around alternatives, I wanted to just ground us in the framework that the city has been using to talk about um, public safety transformation. Um, and so it, it basically has, um, and, and how we're thinking about it today, has three pillars, um, prevention, alternatives, and reform. So preventing crime and violence from happening when possible, exploring alternatives to police response also where possible, and um, when police are um, required, ensuring that they show up in a way that eliminates bias and harm. And so there is um, a lot of work, as Director Musicant just mentioned, um, a lot of work happening around prevention in the health department. Um, like I mentioned, the coordinator's office, um, uh, Office of Performance and Innovation is leading alternatives and um, and the police department with the, the mayor's office and, and civil rights are doing some work on reform. Across the top, you'll see engagement. Um, this is the year long community engagement process that the, um, that the elected leadership of the city um, set out to achieve last year. And that is really um, checking in on, are these the right pillars? Is this the right path? Um, and, uh, and, and so that's across all of the three pillars um, though we know and are engaging in um, engagement within each of the pillars as well. And the same thing for policy analysis that, that happens across the three pillars. And so there's the um, human rights investigation and some operational assessments and studies being completed around public safety for the city. And then there's policy analysis that happens within each of the pillars as well about what can and uh, needs to change. So today, the, the piece that I'm going to be talking about specifically is around alternatives. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so this is a, a list of the pilots that the um, Office of Performance and Innovation is in the process of implementing. Um, and they are in various stages. Um, the, code you see, so MH1, MH2, R5, those um, refer to the specific budget um, 
amendment items. And so we've just maintained that to connect to the dollars. Um, but they basically fall under two categories that were identified through um, a number of working groups and several um, uh, community surveys and um, community focused user centered um, uh, prototyping sessions um, around and we're really looking at alternatives around uh, mental health or behavioral health response and report only um, incidents and a report only incident is um, like when something has happened, um, a bike is stolen from a garage, there's no evidence, no one's on the scene. Um, the only action to be taken in the moment is to take a report. Um, and so around um, the mental and behavioral health, we had put forward a, a suite of recommendations um, to support a, an alternative response at every stage of, of an incident and, and phone call to 911 and response happening. So um, you'll see MH4 pilot community de-escalation training um, and, and behavioral health training was really about um, feedback we heard from the community about how to recognize a behavioral training for people who are high touch with um, persons experiencing mental or behavioral health crisis um, available to anyone in the community um, around how to recognize a mental and behavioral health crisis um, what the options are for who can be called, so anywhere from hotlines to 911, um, and then what to expect um, when they call and also what kinds of information to provide so that the right response can be sent. Um, and then we have a set of recommendations around um, what happens at the dispatch center. So if, a, if someone does call 911, um, providing uh, behavioral health or mental health training for 911 dispatchers, um, and then also embedding mental health professionals in 911. Um, and then the last piece of that is who actually shows up. And so that's the mobile um, mental or behavioral health crisis response teams. Um, and so we are piloting having uh, um, two teams operating one north, one south, um, 24 seven. Um, and they would be the first responder to um, those behavioral health calls. Um, and we are uh, have those on the ground um, in June. On the report only alternative um, responses, we're, tra we, we're um, taking a couple different paths. One is um, transferring, trans transferring report only calls um, to uh, 311 um, rather than to a police response. Um, or providing an option which already exists today to report online. Um, and actually the 311 option already exists today as well. Um, and then the other is training non-police um, city staff to take theft and property damage reports and, and collect evidence um, uh, in person. Um, next slide, please. So, like I said, those are at various stages. I think the one most folks are interested in are the behavioral health teams. And I, I mentioned those little, we're planning for, for those folks to be on the ground, um, hopefully in June. Um, but this slide just um, shows when we'll be providing um, public updates and what kind of information will be provided. So we have quarterly updates that we're sharing with city council, um, which go through, uh, and we just provided our Q1 update about the various stage of, uh, stages of planning for the pilots. Um, our Q2 update will hopefully be our very first glimpse at how things are going for the behavioral health teams on the ground and the theft report only transfer, which we're hoping to have um, uh, active in June as well. And then um, September will be a probably more data heavy type um, update showing what we're seeing and what we're learning. And November will be um, final recommendations, if any, for 2022 budget changes. I do wanna note that we're referring to um, these as pilots and some, and, and they are all pilots in the sense that we are, um, we are trying out multiple models and um, I, I like to say reserve the right to, to change what we're doing depending on what um, the community says and what the data shows. Um, but the behavioral health um, work specifically has been funded ongoing. And so it is a pilot to see how to do it and not if we're going to do it. And I think that's a really important distinction. There's no, um, at this point, like 
once they launch, I, there's no sort of end of the pilot where the teams would come out of the field. Um, the plan is to just continue to adapt based on what they're seeing. And I, based on some of what we've heard from other cities, I think we really anticipate the demand being greater than what we have and, and some additional recommendations to meet that demand coming for the next budget cycle. And that's all I have. I have an appendix I can share lots. You don't have to go through those, but there are, this is available um, online and I can answer questions about some of the details using those slides if it's helpful. Thanks, Andrea. And we can certainly make the slides available to the community members on our blog when we recap this conversation. Um, I am going to pass off, I believe, Chief uh, Arredondo, you're up next if you're ready. Thank you so much. Good evening, uh, Ms. Berkey. Um, so um, I, first of all, thank you so much for having me in this space this evening. Um, um, my focus really is going to continue to be centered on uh, the transformational work and change of the Minneapolis Police Department um, under the, 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 the model of we must first do no harm, uh, but also making sure that everything that we do is based on the pillar and the foundation of human rights and, and recognizing our community is, is necessary for our own existence and for us to have healthy communities and certainly to have true community, uh, true community safety. And so um, what does that look like? Well, a, a lot of that work will, will be really about engaging, engaging and engagement with our communities and focusing on uh, solution-based um, uh, results, but, but really in collaboration, in partnership with our, our communities. Um, uh, it's also uh, about looking at things from different lenses. I, I'm so happy that uh, our deputy city coordinator, uh, Ms. Larson, is on the line. Um, she had been working with me years ago. She's probably smiling in my office. Uh, I was a deputy chief at the time. But looking at these uh, other alternative models, um, we want to continue to explore ways in which um, we can have uh, viable, trusted um, alternatives uh, to help in the health and safety of our communities. And so we'll continue to have a uh, lean in and, and be good stewards and partners with our other city enterprise folks who are really doing some great work in this area. Certainly uh, Deputy uh, City Coordinator Larson is doing this, Commissioner Music Canton in, in our, in our health, uh, public health system, but also Office of Violence Prevention. I don't know if Director Cotton is with us today, but um, there's been a lot of forward work already in that, teaming and partnering with our communities um, uh, having community-based uh, intervention teams. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, uh, and uh, Deputy City Coordinator Larson's uh, presentation was about how do we break the cycle of violence? And uh, I will tell you that that is something that I'm constantly focused on uh, because by the time we're called, sometimes obviously the violence has already occurred. And so what are some ways that we can look at doing that? Um, another thing that I really want to be very intentional for the police department is um, a population that has often been disregarded or certainly seen as in, or been invisible has been our young people. And um, we have to start as a police department really meeting them in that space, uh, listening and learning from them. There's so much that is impactful to them. Um, we are oftentimes the, the, the folks that wear this uniform are the first face of government that they will encounter. So we have to continue to make sure that uh, we're leaning into our young people and, and also having them not only at the table, but having them really set the table in terms of what uh, we can do better in terms of what that community uh, safety looks like. Um, data is very important in all the work, all of the, the uh, my city enterprise peers that you're gonna hear from tonight, data really drives uh, a lot of the work that we do, whether that's uh, demographic data, whether that's economic data, uh, whether that's crime data. Uh, data is gonna continue to be so very important for us, but it's also making sure that we're getting the right data, the accurate data uh, to better help inform me as I work in collaboration with community to make sure that uh, uh, I'm, I'm being very laser focused on those resources and those things we need to, to keep our uh, four corners of our of our city safe. Um, and um, again, just really trying to broaden and expand uh, that table. Um, we're dealing, obviously, we're all been living with this pandemic. Uh, there's impacts to that in terms of uh, small uh, local businesses, uh, what the impact that has on jobs. 
Um, what are, are young people, children going to be doing when school is up uh, this summer? Um, that all has an impact on community safety and uh, policing alone will not solve that. We really, again, need to uh, lean in with our community partners and stakeholders and, and really help to shape what uh, true community safety looks like as we move forward. So um, that will continue to be a focus in terms of specific public safety, in terms of violence, um, guns. Um, I uh, am making sure that we and my team members are doing all we can to reduce the prevalence and the volume of gun violence that we have seen. Um, uh, Commissioner Musicans teams uh, have some wonderful uh, uh, folks who are helping with the hospital-based intervention piece, um, but uh, we are we are just seeing, and we've seen over the last couple of years, a a, a number that we don't want to see in terms of the volume of gun violence in our city. And last year uh, in our city, unfortunately, we had close to 600 people that were shot and wounded from gun violence. And uh, there's a prevalence of guns out there, and we're working with our federal partners to try to track down how those guns uh, are coming into our community. But uh, but gun violence is certainly going to continue to be a focus. Uh, uh, as it relates specifically to violent crime in our city. Uh, but again, I, I, I've been fortunate enough to be at so many different tables throughout our city. Certainly the Potterhorn Park community is one that is near and dear to me. Um, and I, I, I thank Ms. Montgomery for her leadership in that effort, but I'm learning lots uh, of, of ways to help guide me as we move forward into uh, these next few months here into 2021 and throughout the year. So uh, I'm, I'm inspired, I'm hopeful, and uh, I look forward to continuing uh, the partnership. So thank you. Thanks, Chief. Interim Director Helly, we're passing it on to you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you everybody for uh, the opportunity to give an update tonight. Uh, my name is Brett Jelly. I am the Interim Director of the Minneapolis Public Works Department and um, really representing uh, the, the work of a, a large department and of, of people who are very dedicated to what they're doing. Um, and in particular, I, on the topic of safety and traffic safety, um, there uh, is little, little doubt in, in if you've had a chance to work with our traffic staff, how much they care and how dedicated they are to making sure that our uh, streets are safe for uh, if you're walking, rolling, biking, using transit uh, and driving. So uh, going to give a, a quick update, kind of starting at a high level. Um, there's this question um, kind of to you know, prepare me for tonight was kind of looking at how we're maintaining increasing safety and livability in the city. And that really, kind of starts at a foundational level with our policies and plans. So as you might know, late in 2020, the city adopted a transportation action plan. That tra transportation action plan really is the foundation for how, um, uh, for explaining how we are going to attain our goals in the areas of climate and safety and equity, prosperity, mobility, and active partnerships. And a, a, uh, a plan and a policy that was approved a few years ago that really is, um, I think, informs a lot of that work is our Vision Zero policy. Uh, and that the Vision Zero statement is uh, a vision of zero traffic related fatalities and severe injuries by 2027. We have an action plan. <clears throat> We're doing the work every day. And really, just what's important about having these policies and action plan frameworks, it really, uh, first of all, those policies go through robust public participation. Um, there's a lot of community outreach um, involved in developing those plans. And then we bring them through the city council and they're adopted. So we have uh, a policy framework, we have the policymaker support, and we uh, have the community's support as well. And then we can take that plan and really uh, establish multi-year um, action plans where we can uh, use data, apply equity frameworks, uh, to create our project lists. And so, you know, one example of that is um, when we're using data you know, to inform our work, we know uh, that there's a higher proportion of severe fatal crashes occurring in uh, areas of concentrated poverty. Um, so 
we can use that information to uh, inform the work we do each year. And uh, much of that is in our capital program, so we have the funding to do it. And we just had a, a report on our, uh, looking back at 2020 uh, for the um, Vision Zero Action Plan, we improved 29 intersections. Um, and again, because we know that there's a disproportionate impact of these, um, these accidents in areas of concentrated poverty, a higher proportion of that work was focused in those areas. And uh, you can see that report was given uh, last cycle actually um, in the uh, city council meeting and you can kind of see our plans for the work. Much of that is uh, of those improvements are planned in the south side. Um, so that's kind of the, the bigger kind of uh, long term looking forward five, six year planning efforts we do and how we use our policies. Now I know that there are also kind of the day to day things that come up. Um, I've been working with the city for 20 years. I spent half of that time um, either in uh, working in elected offices or in roles where I was you know, working on kind of constituent issues. And I know in, in 2020 in our, our Vision Zero report kind of acknowledges this, that we, we saw more um, kind of dangerous activity on the streets from you know, kind of driving behavior. And so we were seeing more calls and just, you know, kind of in my experience, um, how to be the most effective in working with us is first of all, using 311. Um, I know it's not always the favorite um, suggestion uh, when, I, when I talk to residents, but it really is, um, it's the best way for us to take in information. We, man we can manage the data, we have the data. Um, and then, you know, we can use that to respond and I'll, you know, from a practical matter, you know, four 311 calls is more effective than, you know, one 311 call, one post on Instagram, one post on Twitter, one post on Facebook. Um, if we're, you know, we can uh, pretty easily see if there are, is an emerging issue someplace that we need to respond. We, there's 5,000 citywide traffic safety requests a year, you know, that's 13 a day. So, um, again, allowing us to see where the emerging issues are and focus our energy there is really helpful. And then um, just being specific with what you're seeing when you when you make those calls really kind of helps us uh, respond in a, in a smarter and more effective way. The other thing to note there is, you know, traffic calming is, is a neighborhood-wide commitment. Um, and I just think understanding that, that um, a residence in, in a three block area, they might not all agree on what the problem is or what, what mitigation options um, are best. You know, things like speed bumps and, and one ways and um, those types of different things um, are best done through a process and conversation that includes neighborhoods and includes the residents, it includes the elected officials. So just uh, keep that in mind and then as that information comes in, I think looking to 21, um, we're certainly in a different place than we were last year. I, I think we, our staff learned um, a lot of lessons that we are going, we're already putting into place. Um, you know, some examples of, of, of responses last year, you know, we, we did some uh, traffic calming around 38th in Chicago and Powderhorn Park. We've done some speed bumps by Little Earth. Uh, we worked with residents on 18th Avenue. So we, we kind of, uh, you know, last year, this, this last year was unprecedented in many ways. And, you know, I think we're, we've tested out some tools that we can use. We're also um, looking at some of the new federal funding um, opportunities and ways to give ourselves more resources to do kind of these, um, uh, tactical responses in areas that are something unusual is happening. Um, you know, I think maybe one of the better examples from last year is uh, if a homeless encampment uh, popped up in a park or in an area where it, we just had a lot more traffic, we might, um, we'll be better able to respond quickly. So just, you know, to recap, emphasizing that you know, this is, uh, safety is a core part of what we do as a department. And we, um, we certainly are in ready to respond and um, in a good place, uh, I think, going into the summer. Thank you, everybody, for your time.
Thank you, um, Interim Director Jelly, so much for you being our final panelist. I am going to tee up a couple of things. And before I do, also want to give um, a deep thank you to um, Chief Arandando and um, Deputy um, Andrea Larson and Commissioner Gretchen Musicant for being with us tonight. The first thing that we want to do to kind of transition, we're going to share a poll. Um, we're going to share a poll with you just related to some of the things that you've heard. If you could go ahead and take a few seconds to respond to this poll. I think that ultimately our aim here is to just kind of get a sense of where you are at, those who have been able to join us tonight in terms of what you've heard. As again, we're trying to understand as a collective community, um, what degree of preparedness do we believe that we have as we move into this next season, um, where we know that we've often seen an uptick in challenges that um, affect livability and safety and sometimes reveals where there's not resources to actually support people um, given where they might be at in their journey. So I think that you can see the results in real time here. We can see the numbers inching up. I know that some people could be in the kitchen preparing food or watching Netflix, but if you wanna run back to your computers and make sure that you're able to take the poll, that will be great. It also is helpful as we attempt to kind of document tonight's meeting in terms of people's generals, uh, the people who were able to contribute tonight or participate, your general sense of where we are as a city and certainly where we are as a neighborhood um, as being one in South Minneapolis. So thank you for doing that. I think we, um, if we're gonna give it maybe 15 more seconds and then we will end the poll. I appreciate everyone um, doing that. So we can kind of see that there is, as the results are coming in some confidence um, it's not no confidence, which is a good thing. Um, but I think what's notable is that there's not great confidence currently in terms of the results that are coming in, in terms of where we are as a city, having the resources in the right places um, to support and contribute to improve livability and safety. Um, and then the second question was really related to um, asking uh, which of the following various resources do we think are gonna be most important in addressing public safety? And right now there looks like there's a tie, the violence interrupters alongside um, the police efforts to remove guns from the streets, um, both received 28%. Um, so thank you all for taking a moment to do that. I've just ended the poll and we're gonna jump um, very speedily into the questions. We're gonna do our level best to kind of mix up the questions so that all of the panelists that are with us tonight are able to respond. I'm gonna ask that all of the panelists come back uh, on, release your video, join me on screen, um, just so that it's easier for everyone to hear from you and to see you as we move through these questions. Really the first question is um, more so I think for Gretchen. Um, so Commissioner Musicant, it reads as follows. Can you share specifically what groups are on Lake Street and 38th in Chicago doing violence interrupter work. Um, it goes on a little bit more and it says, who are the two consultants doing GVI work? And who are the two South Minneapolis organizations doing outreach related to the trial? And lastly, who are the eight groups in South Minneapolis under the blueprint approved institute? Um, yep, doing work. So I know that was a lot and I can we can do those in turns if you're able to, if you have the information or if you would need to respond back, but there is a, basically a series of questions about who's doing the work, some of the work that you described. Great, and I think I can answer some of them. I perhaps may not remember all of the questions, but um, so uh, in terms of uh, the, the two teams that are working on the South side um, related to uh, the trial, I think that was one of the many questions. Um, NACDI and uh, the Center for um, Multicultural Mediation are working specifically on the South Side. Um, I believe- And I can, I can repeat the other, the first part. It was asking, can you tell us which groups are supporting the Lake Street Corridor and 38th in Chicago doing the violence interrupter work? And I can pause there. Yes. Um, let me see if I can answer the other questions and uh, maybe I can hone in on answering that one too. Um, okay. Yeah. So uh, one of the questions was about um, who are the folks working on GBI in the South Side? And um, 
David Carson is working with the American Indian community predominantly and also uh, some uh, members of the African American community in South Minneapolis. And then uh, Mohammed Abdullahad is uh, helping us uh, work through the, the, um, the model for the uh, youth focused uh, GDI junior in South Minneapolis. So those are the two folks that are working there. Um, I think I was asked about who are the eight uh, organizations in South Minneapolis that are working with the Blueprint Approved Institute. Was that that was one of the questions? Exactly. Too? Yep. Um, and uh, we have Agape. We have Touch Outreach, um, African American Survivor Services, uh, Becoming a Man, Black Army Brigade. They are working both north and south. Uh, DAC Lifestyles, which is uh, both working north and south, and uh, CIWA AIFC. I'm not sure if that's pronounced as a word, but that's both north and south. And then um, Elliott Park uh, Gatekeeper Ministries Organic Oneness working in south. Um, so those. Oh, I, I remember the other question. Um, I, I believe at 38th in Chicago working right now is Agape. I would have to defer on answering the question on who is working on Lake Street and I will have to find that out for you. Thank you. We will make sure we follow back up. Thank you so much. The next okay. question is really for uh, Deputy Larson and it's how will we know when the various pilots from the OPI are active? How will we know when we can call on them? So it's a two part question. Yeah, that's a great, that was a great question, actually. I think something we can provide is a list of um, estimated timing for when they will be active. The, the two that um, are most relevant for um, like touching residents are the behavioral health um, responders. And we are um, planning on having those folks active in June. Um, and that we're in, we're in an RFP process. And so that will depend a little bit on the providers and uh, once they're selected and their ability to um, start by June and then some technical aspects with getting access to radios, um, police radios specifically. Um, but we are planning on June. And then the, the other one is the report only um, transfers and Today, basically, if you call and you have a report only incident, there are three options for response. If you call 911, a police officer um, can be dispatched. You can also uh, report directly online and you can call 311 and report through 311. In the future, the, the police response um, will no longer be one of the responses provided. It will just be um, online and 311. And so 311 is in the process right now of staffing up they have a very long, lengthy training program to be able to take on those calls. And we are planning on um, having those officially transfer in the end of May. Um, uh, but I think we can do a better job outlining like which things are gonna be implemented and when. Um, and then how to know who to call. The good news is um, you won't call anyone different, right? So if you're seeing a behavioral health crisis, um, happen, you would still call 911. The difference is in who will respond. And so um, we are working right now on a communications and messaging and engagement um, effort to make sure that when that change happens, it is, it is very well known so that people know what to expect um, and, and that, that there will be a different response for those kinds of calls and for report only calls. So just a, a couple of clarifications, and I think that maybe I could have reread the question incorrectly, but I think it's more about, do you have an estimate um, in addition to the pilots, but I guess maybe you indicated that you could provide a list, but when people would be able to call 911 or 311 and then expect a different responder to show up. I think that was the heart of it. Is that what you were saying in terms of June for the behavioral? Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. The next question is for um, Interim Director Jelly. Uh, how do you expect to achieve Vision Zero when you reopen the streets at 38th and Chicago to two-way traffic when there are still thousands of visitors? What is the plan for that? 
Uh, thank you, and and that's a good question. So um, in the uh, interim design options that uh, the traffic team has been working on, uh, they include a few different things. Um, they will include um, some additional traffic calming um, as needed on, on 38th and Chicago. Uh, we're going to be adding um, signage and, and refreshing lane markings uh, as needed and, you know, preserving as, as much space as we can um, for the art memorials, uh, other items while, um, you know, realizing that one of the other important aspects of, of um, the conversation has been providing the access for the businesses and residents and, and eventually reestablishing transit that we're, we've been hearing pretty loud and clear from, um, uh, from people in that, in that area. So, you know, it's, there are other parts of the city where, you know, we, we have uh, events and, and, and lots of people walking around. Um, and so it, 38th in Chicago certainly has some, some unique characteristics, but I think we'll uh, go into it with that plan. And then, you know, if we need to adjust, we certainly will. Thank you. Um, the next question is for you, Chief. Um, how will MPD distinguish violence interrupters from regular civilians? Are these two groups working together? Thank you, uh, Director Montgomery, for your question. So, um, so yes, one of the things, and, and certainly uh, Commissioner Musican is aware of this, but um, we've been working very closely with them. And that means not just, um, um, I mean, we've had meetings, we've been orientating them, knowing um, the, the staff members, the teams who are going to be out there. Uh, we've had, uh, uh, through uh, Commissioner Musicant and Director Cotton, uh, we've had meetings with the, the different precincts uh, supervisors so that their folks, the leadership knows who they are and, and, and that will um, continue. They also um, will be, um, and I guess, uh, Commissioner, it might be seasonal, but uh, I can see they'll be identified by whether it's in the summertime, t-shirts, if it's in the wintertime, perhaps a jacket or some sort of vest or something, but, but there'll also be um, uh, opportunities for them to, uh, uh, to be identified, readily identifiable as well. And um, um, so yeah, so, so that relationship will continue. Uh, we plan to continue to make sure we're having orientation so that even if they're going into um, uh, a certain part of the precinct or the city, um, that they haven't been to a full, for a while, that we're continuing to make sure that they have uh, an idea of who the leadership is out there in terms of the supervisors at the precincts and um, uh, because we're gonna be working right in tandem with them. So that's gonna be very, uh, very important. So yeah, uh, was there a second part to that, Director Montgomery? Um, no, Chief, but you know, I just wanna say that I can't take credit for it. I'm happy that you're willing to give me credit for good questions, but I just wanna recognize that it's coming from the amazing community members. I'm just giving voice to them <laughs> to keep us moving. I do wanna well, do a quick time check and I'm hoping that we can get through maybe two or three more questions. So if you could all be mindful to kind of speak expeditiously, but clearly. Um, this question may be for each of you, depending on what you know about the situation. It's in regards to the survey that was sent out about the different design options um, for reopening the 38th street in Chicago intersection. The question is, does the city have a standard or guidance for their community engagement process? It's a two-parter. And how did sending the same survey with only two predetermined options meet that standard? I'll probably take this. I, I could throw it to uh, you know Andrea and, and see what kind of answer she had, but I don't think that'd be very fair. Um, <laughs> So, uh, thank you, thank you, interim director. Jeff. Yeah, no, I, I think that I think that question's for me. Um, the uh, there there's there was some space between um, the outreach efforts on on 38th in Chicago, and that just as a reminder, there was an extensive amount of of outreach and, and community conversations, and and if you want to look at the 38th in Chicago website, that's reflected there on interim design options in the fall, kind of leading up to the winter. And um, that included reopening options. And then that, that work was paused. And um, we picked up that work um, this winter. And really it's, it's pretty, it's very consistent with our process in public works to present some options, get feedback and provide uh, 
some refinements to those options. And in this case, you know, both options did assume a reopening of the intersection, but there were some differences in those two designs and some trade-offs in those two designs. And it was important to city leadership to get feedback from the people in the immediate neighborhood on, uh, on their preference. So uh, that, that's kind of, I guess, some background on, on that work. Thank you, Interim Director. And just so for all the attendees to know, if there's additional clarity that we can seek after this meeting, we will do so. Um, the next question um, is really probably for Chief again. Glad to see increased and, and potentially a commissioner uh, musicant. Glad to see increased GVI intervention in South Minneapolis, but what will be done about the 24 seven drug and sex trafficking in and around Bloomington and Lake, which may or may not show up as violence? Yeah, uh, Director Montgomery, thank uh, for the community member for that question. So I, I, I know that while a lot of focus has been, uh, and understandably, around uh, 38th in Chicago, um, we have not, and I certainly, uh, our folks are not taking our eye off the ball as it relates to other parts of the city. And, and certainly that Bloomington Lake area has been one that, that we are absolutely focused on. And so um, the, um, some of the challenges, some of the issues that folks are experiencing over there with narcotics is something that we're, we're certainly aware of and, and, uh, and, and dealing with, and certainly the sex trafficking. And for the, for the uh, sex trafficking piece, um, we continue to do a lot of outreach. This goes back to um, some of the uh, comments that uh, Deputy Larson has made. Um, that is, we've, we've evolved in terms of the uh, public safety, in terms of policing. We had, for many, many decades, we had looked at, um, uh, we did not look at the victims of that sex trafficking, and we were penalizing them just the same and not doing a deeper dive into um, the root causes as to why someone may ultimately um, uh, uh, just be subjected to that, that type of uh, uh, treatment and environment. So we're working closely with our advocates. We'll continue to do that. Um, and um, uh, we have a great relationship with those advocates. We, matter of fact, we have been working with, through the county attorney's office, uh, they have provided us advocates as well, uh, victims advocate services. And so we're continuing to do that work, uh, continuing to, to, to track down. We've been working with our federal partners as well. Uh, because I will just share with our community members on the line here too. There are absolutely statutory consequences if someone's charged with felonies here in Hennepin County for that. But federally, that tends to wake folks up who have been perpetrating against um, uh, our, against individuals who have been uh, uh, pred preyed on in, in terms of sex trafficking. So we'll continue to do that. We're working with our neighborhood groups, our businesses, uh, trying to receive as much information as it relates to the drug trafficking, uh, the drug narcotic cells and working closely with Inspector McGinty's teams out there, but we have not taken our eye off the ball on that area of the city. And so while there's concentrations, of, obviously at 30th in Chicago, uh, I'm hearing from the neighborhood associations, our nonprofits along Lake Street as well, and, and trying to make sure that we really do address that. And also lastly, just the alternative methods too, whether it's the uh, violence and, um, uh, uh, interrupters and, and others, uh, community-based folks. Uh, if we go further into um, uh, uh, Little Earth, the AIM patrols. I mean, we've we've got we've got some resources out there to help us in terms of reducing um, the type of violence and things we're seeing out there, and uh, making sure that we're reducing community harm. Thank you. Chief. Just add one small uh, detail. The um, program I talked about, the Next Step Program for Violence, we are developing a, pro a similar program for opioid addiction and so that we intervene uh, when there is an overdose and help people make a transition at that point, um, get into treatment. And so we're, we're developing that as a prevention approach to complement all the things that you've talked about. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Musicant. If everyone would just bear with me so that we could do our closing appreciation to our panelists. Um, and then again, our role tonight was to be more of a facilitator. And I'll just have some quick closing comments because we have this opportunity in this space together. But certainly, Gretchen Musicant, we thank you for your service and your time this evening. Interim Director Jelly, Deputy Larson, and Chief Arandando, it's been an honor and a pleasure to continue to get to know you a little bit more in these past several weeks. We know that each of you has very difficult roles in whether you be an appointed and or an 
in other elected positions as well, we recognize uh, the weight of the moments that we find ourselves in. And one of the things that we want to acknowledge is the amazing questions that we didn't get into to the chat tonight. But from what I could see, one of the key themes that continues to arise is we need servants like you to continue to help us to understand how we can aid your ability to get more resources so we can move from pilot. And when we think about data so that we can be more prepared season after season than what I think the community attempted to articulate through our poll tonight, that there's still just some confidence that we're able and prepared to face all the things that are ahead of us. That's not an indictment, that's not a critique. I had an opportunity to share with uh, Commissioner Musican at the beginning before we started that we like to see ourselves as trying to apply positive pressure when we can, but we also need your help to, uh, to tell us where we as community members can help you apply pressure to get the resources that your departments need in order to truly improve our lived experience in our communities. And so we are counting on you and we are cheering for you, but we ultimately want to move behind some of the continued trends that we see year after year in our communities, despite pandemic, and certainly despite the heinous murder of Mr. George Perry Floyd Jr. And with that, I will bring us to a close. I appreciate each of you. This is going to end our recording of tonight's session. Thank you for taking the time to spend an hour with us to consider the question, are we prepared from a livability and safety perspective as we approach the summer season? Everyone, I bid you a good night. We appreciate you deeply. Thank you for your continued service.